All right, film geeks, today's class is about Jesus Revolution, the latest Christian film. Let's talk about it. What's up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of All Right, Let's Talk About It. My name is Savannah. I am your host. I do film reviews and film industry commentary. So Mardi Gras is officially done in the city of New Orleans. Mardi Gras is an absolute blast. If you've never been to Mardi Gras in New Orleans, I would add it to your bucket list. Yes, everything you've heard about the city of New Orleans is pretty much true. Okay, suck it up. Get over it. Put it on your bucket list. Come on down. You're welcome. It's so much fun. Um... And that's, it's my favorite. I love it. I had no idea what I was getting into when I moved down here. What about three years ago, four years ago? I don't even know numbers anymore. So I moved here in 2020. So yeah, three years ago. And I just love it. I love it's It's an opportunity for the community to kind of get together. Fun fact about Mardi Gras in New Orleans is most businesses will um, take off the day for Mardi Gras. Um, you're not going to get trash pickup on that day at all. So Tuesday is my normal day for trash pickup. So no trash pickup. And schools will be off for the whole week of Mardi Gras. So in addition to a regular spring break, they will get the whole week of Mardi Gras off. I mean, it's, it's, it makes sense. It's it's a holiday. here. It's It's culture. It's tradition here. So when it comes to locals enjoying things like parades, most of them are going to go to the parades leading up to the week of Mardi Gras. But it's not uncommon for families that live in New Orleans and surrounding cities to take off on a vacation the week of Mardi Gras because it gets very chaotic. It's kind of hard to do anything. Those two, sometimes even three days, that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, because traffic is horrendous. You can't really go anywhere. God forbid you move your car. You might lose your parking spot. It's it's chaos so uh, families like to escape it and I think families that have been here for for years for generations it gets a little old after a while it's still fun but it gets a little old so yeah you're not going to see a whole lot of locals Mardi Gras day um mostly tourists but come on down it's so much fun so we get a little bit of break after that and then we go right into St. Patrick's Day so more parades except those parades you'll get vegetables like lettuce potatoes carrots cabbage and traditionally people will take what they've caught and make a stew out of it i can't make a stew but it's just fun to catch you know vegetables so jesus revolution let's talk about it i got to see this movie last night at my local amc theater as per usual and it comes out today so what is this thing it's directed by john irwin and brent mccorkle john irwin and his brother um, forget his name, Andrew, Andrew Irwin, um, are kind of up and coming in Christian filmmaking. They've been making movies for some years now, Woodlawn, Girls Night Out, M not Girls Night Out, Mom's Night Out, um, I Can Only Imagine, and now Jesus Revolution. Uh, stars, Joel Courtney, Jonathan Rumi, um, who is Jesus on The Chosen, Kimberly Williams Paisley, Anna Grace Barlow, and Kelsey Grammer from Frasier. This was Interesting for me seeing Kelsey Grammer in this role because I've only known him on Frasier. I've never seen him anywhere else. Um, come at me, I don't care. I, I only know him as hilarious on Frasier. So to see him in this dramatic role was very different and I very much enjoyed that part. So what is this about? This is about the Jesus movement, which was a spiritual, excuse me, a spiritual kind of awakening revival that took place, started in Southern California, eventually stretched to the rest of the country. But it went from about the late 1960s until the early 1970s. And it kind of shook things up a bit and turned things upside down. It really kind of shifted Christianity in this country. And what an interesting pivotal moment because you had the hippie movement, a lot of drugs coming up, but things were just kind of topsy turvy, you know, uh, Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., you know, landing a man on the moon. It was just a lot of things that were happening. Vietnam War was also going on around this time. So just a lot of upheaval, uncertainty, and you had a long, a lot of young people who were just looking for meaning, for peace, for love, for acceptance, and just to avoid a lot of the chaos. And I think that helped to birth this movement. But this movie centers on three men. So you have Jonathan Rumi, who plays Lonnie Frisbee, who was an evangelist, kind of a homeless hippie at the time, who was a bit of the face of the movement and helped to kind of spark and build things in Southern California. He did this with Chuck Smith, who was the pastor at Calvary Chapel. 
And together they they busted the thing wide open. So the movie starts with, you know, Chuck Smith, who is the pastor of this very small kind of waning congregation of, I guess you could say, Christian fuddy-duddies who are very much into the traditional way of doing things. And Chuck Smith meets this man, Lonnie Frisbee, and he's forced to really confront some of the biases and the obstacles that he's placed in his own way because he wants to grow his church, but he's shut his door off to anyone who is very different. These hippies who walk around with no shoes, looks like they, you know, doing drugs, don't bathe. But yet he meets this man, Lonnie Frisbee, who is on fire for, for Jesus, who is traveling, spreading the word of God. And he realizes that, you know what, he has to, you know, move with the times. Things have changed. And if we're going to reach people for Christ, we have to meet them at their level and we have to keep our doors open. So that's where we are. And then you have a third man who is played by Joel Courtney, Greg Laurie. Greg Laurie currently is the pastor of Harvest Christian Fellowship, I believe it's a full name. And it's one of the largest and fastest growing congregations in the country. Um, the mega church of mega churches, if you will, but you never hear anything scandalous about Greg Laurie. I mean, I'm sure there's something one, one place or another, but he's on the up and up, but he was a young man around 17 years old when this movement started. And this movie shows a young Greg Laurie who is living in a trailer with his single mom, who is a bit of an alcoholic and kind of just tuned out to what's going on in the world around her, including her own son. He is in an academy where he's a cadet and he his mom wants to have all these opportunities. He's trying to figure out who he is and where what his place is and where he fits. And he meets, meets this young, beautiful blonde named Kathy who invites him to kind of come along with her and enjoy a freedom kind of life. And next thing you know, he's doing drugs and, you know, his mind is somewhat opened. But then he hits a wall and things just get out of control and he's still where he was before, except now he's filling this void with drugs and it's not working. And in comes Lonnie Frisbee, who kind of runs into him one night and invites him and, and tries to talk to him, tries to love on him a bit and tries to, you know, help him through. Well, unbeknownst to him, unbeknownst to Lonnie, I should say, Greg Laurie, who's been going through it, is kind of on the outs with his girlfriend, Kathy. They were at a party at someone's house and her sister overdosed and almost died. She came out of it, she was good, but that kind of scared her straight, so to speak. She started going away from drugs and we find her. she finds her way into this Jesus movement and invites Greg to come along with her. He's hesitant at first, he's unsure. He goes to a church meeting, he, he feels something. He's like, this must be real, but he's scared because everything prominent in his life has left him and he's not sure if he can trust this as well. But we know who Greg Laurie is now, so we know at some point, right? He decides to accept this, he accepts Christ into his heart and he becomes a minister and he starts to figure out who he is, what his calling is and how to use his gift to reach people. That's kind of what this story is about. This is about three men with three very different gifts figuring out how to be used. And in the middle, and this, this seemingly insignificant question they have for themselves in the middle of this big movement, that's the movie, right? So how is it? It wasn't, is it any good? So, okay, here's the thing, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but I have very low expectations for this movie um, because I don't have high expectations for Christian films in general. I, I usually expect the worst, if I'm being honest. I expect to get, you know, a good, uh, beautiful message, uh, but with low quality production. Does that make sense? I expect it to be message heavy, low quality. Um, I think there are some Christian filmmakers and producers who are starting to break out of that. You have David A.R. White, who produced the God's Not Dead series, which I think he started on a good roll for the first two, maybe three films, but the fourth one I couldn't even finish. It, it was just, it just borderlined on ridiculous for me. Then you have the Kendrick brothers who did, uh, was it the, is it called The Love Dare? Fireproof. It was based on a book called The Love Dare or something like that. Uh, 
what else do they do? They did Fireproof, Courageous, War Room, I think is probably their most popular one. That was actually filmed in Charlotte, which is where I'm from. A friend of mine whom I went to church with, who was actually one of my Bible study leaders, was actually in the film. So if you've ever seen War Room, I know, tangent. But uh, Priscilla Shire, when she is showing off the woman's house and it's a pastor and his wife and he's like going in back and forth the class like this room's been prayed in and she's like yep that was her prayer room his wife used to be my bible study leader love her her name is Giselle she's amazing uh yay okay yeah that has nothing to do with anything and I what did I think of this? So again, you have some, you have your old school kind of Christian films where they're just not very good. You know, it's very heavy and sugar sweet on the message and it's just low quality. You know, it's just enough to kind of give people the, that boost, that feeling that they're watching a film and it fits kind of their moral compass, but it doesn't, it's not good. It's just not good. It's terrible acting, terrible writing, everything's terrible. And and they can kind of get away with it because they know they're reaching an audience that doesn't really care about all that stuff. They just want a good message they can watch with their families. But you have these filmmakers who are like, nope, we want the whole package. We don't want to just, you know, give people a good message, but we want to give them a good movie. We want to give them a good product, a good film. And we want to create movies that don't just appeal to just the Christian audience, but we want to be able to reach people with our art. You with me? I think that's what this movie is. I think even if you're not a Christian, I think there's something in this for you. Now, from a technical standpoint, I thought the movie was a little choppy. So we talked about of the girlfriend, Kathy, how she saw her sister have an overdose. Her sister came out of it. She was fine. And then, you know, the next time we really see her, she's all about wanting to listen to a guy talk about Jesus. I thought that was just weird. Um, I know she's not a focal point of the story, but it's just like, okay, how did she get from there? There, there's just a lot of little, little holes, little things that just didn't connect. And even though she's not a focal point of the story, her role is way too big for us to not get a complete picture of her journey or at least a good picture of her journey. And I don't think we got that. We really, we, all we know is that, you know, she's from this wealthy family. She has a, you know, two parent home, a sister, um, She's kind of the wild child and she's doing drugs. She gets scared. And then all of a sudden, Jesus, like, how did we get from A to B though? That bothered me a little bit. I felt like that, that part was missing because one minute we're seeing Kathy and she is, you know, high as a kite. And the next minute she's listening to, listening to a man preach the gospel. I just, there was a disconnect there. So it, it jumps a little bit and the dots don't connect well for me personally, uh, that, that bothered me a little bit, but other than that, it's very easy to follow along. It's not like you're sitting there asking, wait, how do we get from here to here? I just felt like pieces of the story. It, it just felt, sometimes it, it's just felt a little incomplete, but you could kind of fill in the gaps for yourself, which is, I don't know, kind of annoying. Like, I don't want to have to fill in the gaps for myself. I didn't make the movie. You did. You're supposed to fill in the gaps. You're supposed to make it make sense. There's supposed to be some sort of realism to this, but I'm supposed to accept that she saw her sister almost die. And then this girl who was never surrounded by Jesus people doesn't come from a religious home. All of a sudden is 100% all in when she was 100% all out. I just having my own Christian journey, not that not having those pieces, it bothered me slightly. So it was a little choppy. And I think part of the choppiness was there was a little bit of a rush because these are two stories. We have Chuck and Lonnie and their own story. And then Greg, who has his own story. And at some point, these stories kind of intersect. And once they meet, that's when it blossoms. At least it did for me. I know I've read some reviews where they thought the first hour was probably the best. Uh, but I thought once we got to that convergence and we really started to see Joel Courtney kind of blossom into the character of Greg Laurie, that's when the magic happened for the film. That's when it became beautiful. And that's when it started to flow. That's when it started to move properly. There were still some parts that kind of lulled a little bit. But I mean, you, if you've been listening to me do reviews for the last however many, what, year and some change, you know how I feel about pacing and that pacing or a terrible pacing can bother me. This bugged me a little bit, but I wasn't that bothered. I thought I still really enjoyed 
this movie. I think it's a beautiful film. Um, I think the way this portrays the church, and we'll talk about more of that in a second. I, I love the way they portrayed the church. I love the way they portrayed Christians in general. There was just a sense of honesty and authenticity to it that was that drew me in. And I think if you're someone who's kind of opposed to Christianity, I think the authenticity in which they portray Christians, because I think in a way you're going to see Christians the way you see Christians. Does that make sense? You might have a very specific way that you see Christians. I think that's what you're going to see here. I don't think you're going to see that sugary, sweet, Cody Christian that we see in a lot of films. I think you're going to see people as they are. And that to me is the draw for this film. There is an authenticity about it. That's just so hard to ignore. Um, I thought the performances were so good here. They were great. I mean, Jonathan Rumi, who plays Jesus in The Chosen, he's a devout Catholic. This is a passion of his, um, you know, teaching and spreading the gospel through film is his thing. It's what he enjoys doing. And so this is where he's kind of been for the last couple of years now, because the chosen has pretty much been his main project. He's done some things here and there, mainly with television, but for the most part, um, film, you know, he's really just really digging his toes and stepping into Film, not film, Christian film. So I've, I've seen him in like a couple of little things, little appearances here and there, but I think this is where he really shines because he's so passionate about it. So when he is preaching in this film, you know, obviously he's, it's acting, he's playing this character and he did such a great job um, being this man the different many layers to him when the facade starts to come off a little bit and we start to get the real Lonnie Frisbee and we really got to get to see some of his flaws and his faults and his ego come out. Um, but when he's preaching, it's just very evident that Jonathan Rumi believes what he's saying. And it's coming from a very real place. Um, normally it can be very difficult when you have people who are too close to the subject matter portraying it but he's an actor's actor he knows what he's doing yes this is his faith but he knows how to put on a show at the same time so mad respect seeing Kelsey Grammer um emotional in the way that he was I've never seen him that way I've only seen him in Frasier that's it that's it cheers and Frasier that's it that's all I know of him I only know him as this you know ironically sarcastically funny guy so it was wonderful for me to see him kind of display this range of emotion that I've never seen from him that I would have never associated with him. He's an actor and he's so good at what he does. He, he, that theatrical training it's there. Joel Courtney. I know him from uh, super eight. Great movie. Great safe sci-fi film. Love that movie. Oh, that the movie is so epic. It's so good. And he's so grown up. He's a big kid now. And I think he did a great job of portraying this man who is just very lost and he's unsure of his next step, but yet he is trying to walk in faith that he was to me, just the, a good picture of the Christian journey of, of trying. He just did it. I, I, that's he did that. And I, I love the way they set up Greg Laurie in here to really just be honest about the Christian journey, that it it's, it starts rocky and it's it's always weird and things don't always go your way. And sometimes it's hard and you just got and sometimes you just want to check out, but you want to be present. And. But faith, walking in faith, it, it takes something deeper and bigger than you to even take those steps. I thought that was so well done. I don't know anything about Anna Grace Barlow, um, Kimberly Williams, Paisley. Um, I can't find who her actual character is. I didn't stay long for the credits because I was looking for my charger. But Anna Grace Barlow, I've never seen her in anything but this. At least I don't think so. Kimberly Williams, Paisley is Brad Paisley's son. So I love her by default. Yep, that's it. So the movie is beautifully executed it's just a little choppy it, it rushes a little bit trying to get to its point doesn't really take its time it runs about two hours but it's a beautiful film it's beautiful I think it's just a very beautiful film I think this is a film that can appeal to both Christians and non-Christians alike <laughs> Thank you. 
big question that I've been getting from for the last couple of days are what are my thoughts on the Asbury revival that's happening or happened? I think it just ended at a university in Kentucky. It went on for about 13 days and saw thousands and thousands of people. Um, I don't know much about it. I don't know what has spawned from it since. I have seen a lot of people on my Instagram, um, different Christian leaders whom I follow posting about it, but um, what are my thoughts? I don't know if I have too many thoughts because I haven't really been keeping up with it. I haven't been following it that much. I haven't watched any live streams of it or hardly any videos, but I am aware. I think it's beautiful. I think it's amazing to see so many young people gathering together, worshiping and praying and just, you know, getting together in the name of Jesus. I think it's amazing. I think it's beautiful. It's such a wonderful sight to see, especially in the times that we're living in. I think what I find upsetting about the whole thing are some people's reactions to it because people have been calling it a revival. And the number one criticism I've seen from people are people who are just not wanting to call it a revival thinking, Oh, we overuse that word and yada, yada, yada. We should we be calling this a revival because people are getting together and they're praying and whatnot, you know, that to me just seems kind of trivial. So I'm just looking up the word revival real quick. Yeah, just different articles about, because everyone's calling it a revival. So what does revival mean? It's an active instance of reviving, the state of being revived, such as renewed attention to or interest in something. So by definition, this is a revival. It is a renewing for a lot of people because a revival is great for people who are kind of where I'm at right now, where I'm just kind of, I'm not dead in my faith, but I'm not on top right now. I'm kind of lukewarm. And that's just kind of where my head is at right now. I'm just kind of lukewarm. So a revival is great for people like me who need a jump start, who need a, who need to remember the why behind it all and need to reconnect with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus. So revivals are perfect for people like me. And I think people forget that. A revival, I think people have this expectation that revival means that it has to be explosive to some level or something has to come out of it. That's not the thing. What comes out of it could be something very small, like a, a simple change in one person's prayer life or a, a change in trajectory for someone who has been like me. They've been kind of lukewarm a little bit. So it, it renews a fire and a passion for them. For some people, it, it forces them to rethink they way, the way they do young adult ministries. It might help them to rethink the way they do youth ministries. If for some people, it might even spawn up new churches. Who knows? The change that comes out of it can be very small. It can be very big. So you look at something like the Jesus movement, where from the Jesus movement, you got Harvest Christian Fellowship. Greg Laurie came out of that movement and was able to, he came to Christ through that movement. He started a Bible study. And from that Bible study, he started a church. Something huge, right? But you had a lot of people whose lives have been forever changed because of that. I posted my little initial reactions review on TikTok and on Instagram and comments that I've gotten from people who are like, you know, I was this age during this. It changed my life. It was life changing. It was beautiful. So people are still seeing the ripples from that. So a revival, whether it's small or it's big, it's the change that comes out of it. it can be very small. It can be very big. It does not matter. The fact is there is change. And sometimes that little change can have a ripple that lasts generations. So it's really disappointing for me to see so many people within the faith come out and attack the word revival. Should we be calling this a revival? I'm like, does it really freaking matter? Let God move. And I think that's what I loved about this movie is that it shows what happens when Christians get out of their own way. When I talked earlier about the authenticity and the honesty that this film shows, a lot of movies, Christian films, whenever they're portraying Christians, they always pray, portray Christians as the good guys. They're always sugary, sweet, and happy. They say the right things. You know, you know, have you prayed about it? You know, they, they portray Christians the way Christians want to see themselves and not the way Christians actually are. And the fact is Christians, we're actually very, very messy. We are clumsy because we're trying to go against our flesh or sin nature. Okay. That's what the Bible teaches, right? And trying to pursue the supernatural, which is Jesus. And it goes against everything instinctual. That's what we're trying to do. 
Yet following this almost instinctual trajectory of wanting to have community and purpose and love and fellowship. So it shows kind of the messiness of the Christian journey. It also shows the messiness of the church. That's kind of the 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 genesis of this thing. You have this little church of a bunch of little old fuddy-duddies who, who want the kind of traditionalness of church. And they're very off-put by these hippies who don't wear shoes coming into their church saying they don't belong here. And that when Christians, we get into groups, we're no different than anyone else. We can get very exclusive and we can get into our heads that this thing is only built for certain people. And we forget where we started. We started out messy. We started out doing everything wrong. We started out doing things in our own way, looking however we wanted to look. We started out looking like everyone else. And then eventually when you let sanctification do what it's supposed to do, you start to transform. And sometimes that changes the way you dress. It changes the way you look. It changes the way you speak. And sometimes it doesn't change that much at all, but it changes your heart. And it gives you a way to reach people that other people won't reach. That's what we're seeing happen in this church. We're seeing this preacher who was kind of a fuddy-duddy. He was a square. He was very closed off. And all of a sudden he opens up his heart and he opens his door to these people who are just so different and vilified by these fuddy-duddy Christians. And you see some of those Christians leave because they can't take it. They can't handle it. They've gotten in their own way. They're not letting revival. They don't want revival. They're not letting revival happen. Revival happens when you get out of your own way. When you get out of your own ego. When you stop putting yourself first and you just let God move. That's how revival happens. And I loved how this movie showed that, that this pastor who's been in his own way and his own way has kept his door shut. But when he stepped out of his own way and he took a risk and he walked out in faith, he opened his doors, his building became too small and he had to put a tent out back and that became too small. And now he has to build a bigger building. We didn't get to that part, but now the the revival is too large to contain it. So he has to give the keys to a building to Greg Laurie so he can start his own church and continue in that movement. That's what revival is supposed to do. It's supposed to be so large that the walls can't contain it. And we're seeing that in Asbury. And once the revival in and of itself is done, that's when the ripples start. That's when these people start to go back home. And that's when the change happens. And that change can be small. It could be a change in someone's heart. It can be a change in someone's home. It could be a change in someone's church. It could be a building up of a new church or the burning down of a church that's been dead for a long time and should have been gone a long time ago. But I love the way this movie portrayed revival at its most basic core. It could have gone into something deeper. And I often wondered why in the movie they didn't go bigger because that wasn't the focus. The focus of this movie wasn't the big revival. It was almost a backdrop, but it was the change in these three men. It was Lonnie Frisbee who was getting in his own way. Chuck Smith, who was learning how to step out of his way. And then Greg Laurie, who was learning how to find a way. What we were seeing were the ripple effects of revival. That's what this movie is about. That's what this movie is for. And I think it's perfect timing with what happened at Asbury. I don't think we're going to see the ripple effects right away, but we are going to see them in 20, 30 years. So I think that's the message that I can send to anyone, especially Christians. Get out of your own way. And I'm preaching to myself here. Get out of your own way and watch revival happen. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to me talk about Jesus Revolution. Again, it's a little wonky, a little choppy. I think on uh, my TikTok, I described it as the, the execution of it all, a toddler waking up from for a nap. So it, it weaves a little bit, but it knows where it's going. Uh, but it's a beautiful film. I think whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, like I think you will enjoy this. This is a great film. I think this is great for families. I actually just had a friend of mine text me and ask me, would this be good for her 10 year old nephew? There is a little bit of drug use for those who are wondering, um, but that's it. I mean, it's the it's 60s and 70s, it's hippies y'all. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. So it's there, but this is definitely family appropriate for those who are wondering. And I loved it. I really enjoyed this. And if you go see this, let me know what you think. If you have seen it, let me know what you thought. Um, and talking about Asbury, I guess, let me know your thoughts on that as well. Now, what's 
coming up. I am seeing Emily tonight, the movie about Emily Bronte. Uh, Creed is coming out next week. I need to go ahead and get my ticket for that. And there's a new Children of the Corn movie coming out. I think that also comes out next week. So if m any of my theaters are showing it, I will be watching it. If not, I'll just wait for it to go on Shudder and get a free trial. And then the week after that, I think, I think, I think, I'm not sure. Let me look at my calendar real quick. I think I've mentioned this before that whenever I buy tickets on AMC, the app, it goes straight to my calendar, which is so helpful because sometimes I forget. Which sounds incredibly privileged, but you know, here we are. Yes, so Creed happens next week. And then the week after that, the ninth, I will be seeing Scream 6. Be on the lookout on my Instagram for a list of movies I'm planning on seeing uh, the next month so that you guys know what to look out for. Also the long awaited Black History episode that I owe y'all, that will be coming out on Tuesday. So thank you so much for listening. Love y'all so much. If you're interested in supporting this podcast, check out the description on the different ways you can support me and help me grow as I continue on this podcast journey. I love y'all. I hope you had a wonderful Mardi Gras wherever you were and I'll see you next time. Want to advertise on this podcast? Check the episode description to see how you can be featured on the next episode.